The subject of black history is in dispute in some quarters. A man named J.A. Rogers, who was laughed at 20, 30 years ago, not taken seriously at all, is being taken very seriously these days. A new book called Great Black Men of Color has been edited by our guest tonight, Professor John Henry Clark. Professor Clark, there are some rather startling, to put it mildly, relevations made uh, in the book about uh, certain presumed facts of history that uh, I'm certain will not stick with uh, the general white historical community. Well, I'll tell you, it became almost necessary for the Europeans to whiten up a part of black history when they began to take over the world in the 15th and the 16th century. And what Rogers has done is gone back and taken a whole lot of the white away and showed you the original black faces of certain people in history. Um, in this two-volume work, World's Great Men of Color, volume one is devoted to the old world and volume two is devoted to the new world. The first thing he does is to put Egypt in proper context and to show Egypt and the great personalities of ancient Egypt as black people. And um, it might be startling, but he reveals that um, Cleopatra did not look like Elizabeth Taylor and wasn't a white woman at all. And I think his book starts in Egypt with the other great characters in Egypt, uh, Imhotep, the real father of medicine, father of architecture, build of the steppe pyramids, forerunner of astronomer, a man who was accepted as a god in Europe long before the birth of Christ. Imhotep lived about 5,000 years ago. And early Europe accepted quite a few Africans as, as deities. And Imhotep was, uh, was one of them. He opens the book, actually, with... Um, this great African who was the world's first multi-genius. You said that uh, Rogers put Egypt in its proper perspective. What did you mean by that? I mean, if European historians acknowledge that ancient Egypt was a black nation, then they would have thrown all Western history out of Kelter because Western historiography is based on the mistaken concept that if Egypt wasn't European, it was at least Oriental. It was neither. Um, because Rogers trace, as many competent historians, black and white, have already done, the southern origins of Egypt, and that the people, who would later be called Egyptians, came from deep within Africa, maybe Ethiopia and Somaliland. And they kept good relationships, good and bad, like all families, with the people to the south all of this time. And the proof is positive. And do not think that Rogers is out on a black thing or that most black historians are out on a solely black thing. Most of us got our most radical information from white writers that other white historians do not read, such as Gerald Massey, and his six-volume classic work called Egypt, Light of the World, which proved positively that ancient Egyptians were, were black. Count Vores and his ruins of empires. Gustav Hearns in a six-volume work, uh, researches in um, the ancient uh, history. The early work of the American Egyptologist Breston, uh, Sir Wallace Budge. And so we are going to Radical historians, especially Massey and his Natural Genesis and um, the Book of the Beginning, establish behind them the black prospectus in history. And if white historians accept the black prospectus in, in history, they would have to admit that the white prospectus in history is wrong. And I'm afraid they're not quite equal to that right now. Well, what is the, uh, if there is a black perspective in history, there is a white perspective in history. Mm -hmm. And are, you're saying, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming, that history is being manipulated for an end. In itself. In itself. Uh, history, the, the Europeans began to manipulate 
history when they rose and began to expand into the broader world in the 15th and the 16th century um, because they had to justify the slave trade and they had to justify the colonial system that followed. And modern racism has its incubation in that period. You cannot enslave a man and say he's a human being, that he has humanity, he has, that, uh, and that he was one of the forerunners of the world's religion. You cannot enslave an African and say this about him. Because if you say he's a human being, then you're saying he's an extension of you. Then you cannot sell an African Christianity and call him a heathen and acknowledge the African contribution toward the creation of Christianity. So it's a contradiction mm -hmm. in acknowledging that the man created Christianity, then come back and say that uh, you are selling him Christianity because he is a heathen. So the European had to literally strip history of the contributions of non-European people uh, to a certain extent that did this in Asia. Now what Rogers has done in these two books is to go back and set history in some kind of prospectus based on this information. And all of the information did not come from black historians. Well, it came from mm -hmm. the best records available from all of them. Now, speaking of information, Rogers has alleged uh, some very startling things, and we're using that word because I think mm -hmm. in the context of having had only white history, mm -hmm. anything black is startling. And so I'm saying it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, some of his information has uh, said that uh, there were a number of American presidents who actually were black, that there were a number of prominent Americans that history has treated as whites, who by his criterion or criteria of who was black and white, according to society's definition, were black. Oh, no, not according to Rogers' definition now. Understand, and this is the irony of it all, and this is the trap. Black people have never written any definitions of race, any definitions of what a people mean, uh, uh, has been, I mean, they have never said that these people with these kind of traits belong here because modern racism had its development in the pseudo-scientific development of intellectual Europe after the 15th century. And they began to say that certain kind of people belong to certain kind of race and they created the concept of race and racism itself. Now, According to the laws that still on the statute book of the United States and some other parts of the world, one drop of us makes you a whole. Now, uh, this ridiculous law and stipulation and measurement has given black people a lot of white people according to that law. Now, it has given us Beethoven, uh, who was called a dark moor, now, he was probably one of the many olive-complected Europeans that you see in the millions throughout Europe. But uh, in the States, in the United States, they say that if you have one drop of blood of a black person, you're a whole black person. Now, by this stupid law, we have a whole lot of white people. There's a whole lot of people uh, that think they're white that belong to us. We might claim all of South America because the Spaniards were mulattoes when they got there, having been mixed with the Moors for nearly 800 years, and they were even before the Moorish conquest. Mediterranean Europe was highly mixed with, uh, with Africa. So nobody thought anything of it because uh, um, they were a mixture of power and influence and, and trade, and, and they got along fairly well together for hundreds of years before they turned on each other. And I don't say it did the Europeans any harm because uh, the handsomest people in Europe are, are the olive-complected people who mix with the Africans. You're saying, in, in essence, uh, that there's no such thing as a race. Oh, I've, I maintain that race is the phoniest issue ever invented by the mind of man. The European invented and developed the concept of race. There's no, really no such thing as a, as a race because nature created no races. The whole Race is a man-made thing, you know. Well, how did people get to be French and English? Well, uh, uh, different uh, climatic conditions and migrations and, my, and, and amalgams of, of different people and migrations of people into your country, migrations of people out. All right. Now, this is, this is an ethnic grouping as against uh, what we call race. 
If you go back and you look at an old dictionary, you won't even find a definition for a race. Race grew out of the pseudo-scientific development of Europe. And this is what Rogers was uh, addressing himself to and, and saying that according to your rule, which is ridiculous, a lot of you belong to us. Well, in mm. another context, mm. if race is arbitrary, mm. then could we say that being called black was a political term? It's a political term and a term which indicates our self-awareness at this juncture in history. And I think we really need, uh, we really need it. We need to really bathe in blackness for a while, but I wish we'd get the bath over with and go on to something a little more important because black, black in itself is not an ethnic term. Black tells you why you look, but it don't tell you who you are. We are essentially an African people. Wherever we live on this earth, we're essentially an African people. And we relate to the millions of African people throughout the world, including the uncounted millions of Africans in, in Asia. Uh, the word Afro-American or African-American would probably be more appropriate and more honest and more in keeping with what we actually are. Because all of us are not positively, physically, you know, real jet black. And so the argument now sometimes is between the supernationalists and the mild nationalists and blacker than thou, when blackness is a state of mind, a state of attitude, a state of approach to things uh, that can exist in almost any of us, uh, including from the blonde black person to the, to the jet black. And the jet black can be traitors and they can be patriarchs, they can be a whole lot of... See, we, we, we've been everything in history from saint to baffoons. We are complete people, and we need to start looking at ourselves as a, um, as a complete people. And I think that once we uh, convinced ourselves that we're black and beautiful, we'll stop saying it and just go ahead and be black and beautiful and release a whole lot of energy for more important things. All right, since you said that uh, J.A. Rogers was a chronicler that related events, mm -hmm. What is there in these two volumes in terms of facts in, uh, that would be beneficial to black Americans in the regaining of our lost heritage? Um, in terms of facts is that J. E. Rogers goes through history and places in proper prospectus with documents the role of the black personality in history beginning from the origin of man in Africa to the present time. And I'm saying that black people need a measurement of the role that they have played uh, in, in history. And Rogers was the pioneer in the search for the black personality in history and his role. And this is important because through Rogers, in his uh, first volume on the old world, you can see what the uh, Africans achieved, and what the Africans not only achieved within Africa, but the conflicts among African and African, and how these conflicts were, were settled. Egypt was invaded from within Africa, which began the decline. That was the Kushite invasion, led by that magnificent trio of black generals, Castor, uh, Pianchi, and Tahaka. And the interesting thing about these men, especially to Harker, the last of the trio, is that he not only controlled what is Kush, who is part of Ethiopia and the Sudan of today and Egypt, but he invaded uh, Libya and practically all of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Iran, all in, in those areas. And in those areas, he found both friends and uh, friends and, uh, and, and, and foes. Now, if he found friends and enemies, if he found people in the Middle East willing to fight with him, he a black general. This tells you that uh, color wasn't such a major factor, but the power, the rise and fall of power. Uh, Rogers tells us some other interesting things in Volume 1. Actually, I wish we had time just to deal with Volume 1 alone, because he tells you of the early European invaders, invaders of Africa, after he finished telling you about Akhenaten and the great queens of Egypt and that woman, the first truly great woman in history, uh, Hatshepsut, um, about the black generals who served in white armies, Cletus Nigra, who was one of the commanding generals in the army of Alexander. 
And he deals with the romance around Alexander, which shocked the hell out of some people because Alexander not only did not um, die worrying about uh, no worlds to conquer, he died in a drunken stupor, and all this is documented. Uh, he threw a dagger at Cletus Nigra, the black general, who differed with him in front of his uh, high command. And um, he died in self-reproach uh, after this act, not worrying about uh, no more worlds to conquer. It's another thing. And another aspect of Alexander I, which I call, that I call the so-called great that we need to take into consideration is Alexander was a magnificent diplomat, probably one of the most brilliant diplomats ever. He really wasn't much of a warrior. In fact, one of the main reasons why Cletus Niagara could kid him because he had saved his life on the battlefield a number of times. And Alexander, after he got into Asia Minor, was ridiculing Greek soldiers. And Cletus Niagara, the black general, told him that you wasn't as for Greek soldiers, you really, in effect, not so hard yourself. And he reminded him of the time that he um, saved his life. And Alexander was a little bit embarrassed and insulted by having this mention in front of his high command. And, uh, and he was drinking too much at the time anyway. Now, that takes a whole lot of romance out of history to treat Alexander that way. And, but it's documented truth. Well, what are the, some of the statements, facts, allegations that Rogers makes specifically about who prominent white Americans were who he now says were black? Well, he, um, he said that five of our presidents were black and considering the fact that the ones that were black seemed to be about the poorest presidents we had, I'd rather not bother about getting into names, but advise you to read the small book by J.A. Rogers called Our Five Negro Presidents and argue with someone else. But um, Are there any of the families of these presidents alive who acknowledge that one of their ancestors who was a president was well, I'll black? Name, I'll name one, which, uh, because there's been so much writing about it and so much proof and because some of the families are still alive and uh, someone want to run this down. President Harding had... Um, black blood, at uh, some of uh, what we call Negro blood. Mm -hmm. how, how, where is this documented? Um, there were several articles on it. Uh, Alan Morrison, uh, the late Alan Morrison, used to be New York editor of Ebony, did, a, did an article on it in the first or Negro Digest years ago. But I'll tell you another one, which is why the documents are a little clearer. That's Alexander Hamilton. He wasn't a president, but he was mm -hmm. very prominent. Sure. Alexander Hamilton, whose mother it's a black woman from the, from the West Indies. Are there any other prominent uh, Americans that you can think of that are named in, uh, this would be the second volume? Mm -hmm. uh, no, this is, no, th that would be the second volume in mm -hmm. which he names uh, permanent Americans uh, who uh, obviously had uh, what we refer to as Negro blood. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Browning, the Englishman, and he, he documents that too. Mm -hmm you know, who had laid court to Elizabeth Barrett. And um, I think Alexander Dumas was one of the people he named. Oh, Alexander Dumas. There's no question about Alexander Dumas. He was a brown-skinned man with a bush. I mean, we don't argue about the Dumas, but there were three Dumases. Understand that. Not, uh, not just Alexander Dumas. We talk about grandfather, father, and son. Now, one Alexander Dumas, black general, uh, Western in, uh, descent, was uh, second in command to Napoleon. In fact, he was Napoleon's artillery commander in the Egyptian campaign. And when the French were voting for someone to take over the French army, Napoleon won by one vote. In other words, the French were liberal enough at that time to accept a black man as commander in chief of, of their armies. I'm sorry they didn't um, elect Alexander Dumas. It would have saved them a lot. And, a whole lot of things Napoleon did was useless and nothing but the washing of French ego and costing a whole lot of French money. The one thing I don't think Alexander Dumas would have done is to go into that icebox called Russia in the dead winter time. <laughs> he wouldn't have played no fool like that. <laughs> now, the other two Alexander Dumas, you need to, under, you need to separate because most people mer merge them. Now, 
the father of French adventure literature, uh, The Three Musketeers and the Lag. That's one Alexander Dupas. Now, the, um, the author of Camille and the romantic tradition in French literature, that's his son. Now, all the father and son did not get along, but they stem from the same, um, from the same club. So there was actually three Alexander Dumases. One was a military man, served under Napoleon, who lost uh, command of the French army to Napoleon by one vote. The other one who began the adventure literature, and the other one who began the romantic literature. And um, he was somewhat of a prince of Paris, a devil with the ladies, but there's, there's no argument about these people. Well, how do you, how do you suspect mm -hmm. that these statements and beliefs are going to be accepted by white America and by the white historical community? Well, they're not going to accept them re readily, but uh, if they read the documents, there's not much of an argument. Well, they can always show who. you their documents, can't they? Well, they can show me their documents, but uh, one cannot, uh, ex cannot uh, outbalance the other. I mean, uh, I've seen uh, there's a whole lot of things that white historians say that has nothing to do with documents at all. They just open their mouth and say it. <laughs> like, Christopher Columbus discovered America. Now, he's discovered people here. He discovered a whole lot of people already in America. So he discovered America. Okay. Now, uh, and they just arbitrarily say that uh, the Europeans brought naturally civilization. And actually, the Europeans destroyed more civilization than they brought. And I can go to white documents and prove this. I don't have to go to my documents. According to their documents, I can prove uh, that they destroyed more people and more civilization than... Um, than they build. All right. Another thing which Rogers brings up in another one of his books called Africa's Give to America is the pre columbian presence of Africans in the so-called New World, that Africans were here not only before Columbus, but according to Professor Wiener in a three-volume work called Africa and the Discovery of America, he may have been here before the Indians. Now, the original documentation on this came from white historians. And so many times when a white historian is arguing with a black historian, the one thing he will probably have to do is to go back and argue with the white historian from which the black historian got the original base information, and he extended that research further than the, uh, than the white historian. Now, the white historian is in a bad fix right now because he's hung up with a lie and because he used to open his mouth and say something and people believe it without question, and now they are questioning it. I can snow him under with documents, and mostly documents written by other white people repudiating him. So I'm not worried about the document war. I know I can win that one. Professor Clark, how do you distinguish between the words Negro and black? I, I don't distinguish. I, mean, I, I distinguish between the word the way I held the word Negro is by dismissing it. And I, dismissing it because, I dismiss it because there's no such thing as a Negro, uh, because there's no Negro people and no Negro land. This is an, an adjective that somebody made a noun out of and slapped on a people against their will. And I dismiss the word Negro. Um, the word black uh, can relate to a whole lot of people, and it can become con confusing. You see. People must relate to land, history, and culture. And this is what limits the word black. Because if you limit, if you say black, then what is the black land? I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. If you say English, an image comes before your eyes, good or bad. The changing of the gods, Buckingham Palace, you know, stout hearted, and, you know, the Bengal Lancers, you know. If you say French, you know, good cooking, great lovers, Napoleon, all that. All, all immediately you've got an image. But you say, Negro, what comes before you? No images, really. A condition. And a people is not a condition. A people must have a, land, a name that relates them to land, history, and culture. And so, therefore, the name of a people, if it's going to be authentic, cannot be black, that can refer to how the people look. The name of the people have to relate to the land of origin. Now, no one is having any difficulty saying Italian-American, Greek-American, French-American. 
I don't think they should have any difficulty saying African American or Afro American, as the as the case may be. Now these are people who are black in the main. But let's get something straight. All Africans are not black. The black is the prevailing color in Africa. There are Africans who have been not been mixed with any white people at all, who are light brown. And they've always been that way. And they're just as African as the blackest of the Africans. So if we got hung up on a narrow definition like black without explaining that it has elasticity that extends beyond a person being jet black, then uh, we, we get ourselves into another trap. We get out of one trap and get into two. So now let's qualify what we're talking about when we're black. But when we're speaking of a people on a world basis, then let's relate them to land, history, and culture so we'll know what we're talking about. Until someone creates a nation called black, uh, from which we emulate a uh, black land, a uh, black area, a uh, black borough, then uh, I'm afraid that the word black is rather limited. Right. <clears throat> I'd like to thank you very much. You've, uh, you've certainly said uh, quite a few things. Uh, the book, The World's Great Men of Color, is undoubtedly going to cause quite a stir and be of amazing educational value. Thank you very much, Professor Carr. Thank you.